Today we have a special guest with us, Dr. Micah Green. He is an associate professor of chemical engineering here at Texas A&M. He does research in 3D printing, nanomaterials, and a variety of other subjects. Outside of the lab, he's the faculty advisor for the Navigator Group, and he's involved with several graduate student organizations. Dr. Green, welcome. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So I mentioned that you do a little bit of work with nanomaterials. Could you go into a bit more detail with that? Sure. Uh, people have worked on nanomaterials for, for a while. So the chemical engineering perspective on nanomaterials is to be able to scale those processes up to be able to make nanomaterials relevant to consumer products and do so in a cost-effective way. A lot of nanomaterial research is still stuck in the lab, and so I'm very interested in seeing how that can get out of the lab and actually affect commercial processes and commercial products. Now, one really good example is in the area of 3D printing. We use nanomaterials to enable really strong mechanical welds in plastic 3D printed parts. Outside of the lab, you also teach a couple of classes. I do. I've, I've taught graduate and undergraduate classes. I find myself teaching numerical methods classes a lot, all MATLAB all the time. MATLAB is wonderful. Don't say any or, any different. <laughs> well, there I have my opinions <clears throat> in there. You're not just a science geek all the time. Sometimes you delve into some philosophy, a little bit of religious studies. You're really involved with the Christian Faculty Network? Yes, I'll be leading the Christian Faculty Network this next year. The Christian Faculty Network is an interesting organization. I mean, it, it exists to create a kind of a, a home for Christian faculty and also to signal to the students who are coming in that there's a large group of Christian faculty here at AM who are ready and willing to support them. One of the big things that we do is we organize organize the Veritas Forum each year. Last year, we had Dr. John Lennox come in and talk about uh, naturalism and philosophy, and we're, we're looking forward to what we can get this coming year. That's also a topic that interests you as well. That's right. Since I, I work in the sciences, the relationship between science and Christianity comes up a lot, and it's, that's a big topic in the public sphere. Mm -hmm. I'm very interested in how to relate science and faith. The dichotomy that is usually set up at the popular level is science based on evidence versus mm -hmm. faith, which is not. But that view that I only believe what I can prove empirically, that statement is, is a, actually a philosophy. It's often pejoratively called scientism. And so if you just listen to the statement, the only reliable beliefs are those that you can prove empirically. That statement itself cannot be proven empirically, which means it's self-refuting. That also shows that the statement itself is, is itself a philosophy. There are all kinds of things that we believe that aren't based on empirical, in-the-lab kind of evidence. That's just how life works. But it's really a very empty philosophy. And if you take it to its conclusion, it ends up not being a, a declaration of war on faith or religion, but on philosophy itself. And indeed, some very high-profile scientists like Lawrence Krauss and even Stephen Hawking have made rather outlandish statements that philosophy is dead. Mm -hmm. And then they go on to philosophize. Right. Um, and so this idea of pitting science against philosophy, I think, is a pretty fruitless affair. Um, there are a number of, of other problems that scientism has. It has no ability to, to deal with basic realities. It has no ability to deal with should concepts. Science mm -hmm. describes what is. It doesn't describe what ought to be or what should. And so there's no way that you can talk about ethical norms. You can describe sociologically how people view ethical norms, but you can't describe where they come from. More importantly, empirical science alone can't speak to key experiential questions such as the existence of subjective mental states. Subjective mental states, by their nature, are subjective. They can't be approached from the outside using a microscope or things like that. But one thing I would encourage your listeners to do is to, to look for scientism w when it shows up in subtle ways. People don't usually announce it. Here's my philosophy. I only believe in things that can be proven via empirical evidence. But people will say things like... Uh, like, oh, medical science has, has examined the brain and there's no, there's no such thing as a soul. Mm -hmm. When someone says something like that, you, you really have to push back on them and say, you, you looked for an immaterial soul using a material <laughs> microscope, really? Mm -hmm. People will say things like, oh, what evidence would it take for you to um, overturn your beliefs? That, a statement like that actually is, it, it implies that all beliefs are purely born out of empirical evidence rather than... Mm -hmm first principle philosophical considerations. And I guess my point is you can't get away from those first principle philosophical considerations. No one can. In fact, to even describe something as true or false is pretty difficult within naturalism because effectively what you're describing is a biochemical state. Mm -hmm. These atoms exist in these positions. How can something like that be, be true or false? And so mental states don't have any, any being on, on naturalism. So scientism is, a, is an epistemology. It's about how you know, but it's, it's usually related to naturalism. Naturalism is the view that the natural world, atoms, molecules, energy, that's all that exists. And scientism is, is its cousin saying the natural world is all that you can know about. 
And I, I pick on scientism because mm-hmm. it's it's evidently more weak. It's got clear problems, especially the fact that it, that it seems to fly in the face not only of faith but of uh, philosophy itself. Mm-hmm. So we've done a lot to talk about some of the problems associated with naturalism. However, I don't think it's quite sufficient to just tear down a, a view and say that it's false. What system do you think would be appropriate to replace naturalism? I think the best move for everyone is to approach science and say, what kind of assumptions do I need to make to just start doing science? And it turns out you have to make quite a few. You have to assume that your mind and your senses are basically reliable so that as you gather data, your, your mind is good at telling truth and, and, and synthesizing those things together. So that there's the assumption of cognitive reliability. There's also the assumption that the universe itself is coherent. It obeys certain physical laws that we can understand it, we can predict it, and that there is a mathematical orderliness to the universe. There's a a famous essay called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics. It's actually quite remarkable that mathematics is so useful in describing the universe. Mathematics on its own has to be true, mathematical relations. But the fact that mathematical relationships describe the universe so well, that's not an a priori statement. That's something we find out. It's quite remarkable that that's true. And so the question is, how do we know those assumptions are legitimate? Are you coming at science from a worldview where those assumptions make sense? And I would argue that on naturalism, both of those assumptions are really up for grabs. You don't have a great basis for assuming that your mind does a good job of synthesizing truths and describing the world around it. Cognitive reliability is somewhat undermined. Alvin Plantinga wrote a big book about that topic recently called Where the Conflict Really Lies, and that's the heart of his argument. And the nature of the universe, to assume that it's orderly, to assume that it's understandable, is also somewhat ad hoc. It's hard to describe why that has to be the case on naturalism. I personally am a Christian, and I feel like both of these assumptions fit quite nicely within a Christian worldview. And that's actually borne out historically. When you read people like Pascal, you read Copernicus, you find that they approach the natural world and they say, there is a God who, who ultimately, in some sense, is a mind. He made the world and he made our minds in such a way that he wants us to understand how the world works. So cognitive reliability and the understandability of the universe fit really nicely and actually go together because both of them come from the same creator. I think it's important to clarify your argument. You're not saying that because the universe is orderly, we can infer Christianity, but you're saying that Christianity has more explanatory resources in order to explain the natural world. Yeah, I guess I would say that the assumptions you need to start doing science fit nicely within a Christian worldview. Here at A&M, there are a lot of Christians that are in the sciences. What recommendation would you have as a professional scientist for those of us that are students or maybe even graduate students on being a faithful Christian in the sciences? I think one of the biggest things for Christian students is to to not be afraid of the sciences. There has been this implicit cultural wave that science is unfriendly to faith, that it doesn't fit, and that you should be scared or that you should avoid certain classes. And I would really want to dispel that belief. When I was fairly young. I remember I had some difficulty with the Bible passage. It didn't make any sense. I didn't understand it. And I asked someone a question and they kind of shushed me. They said, be quiet, you know, don't ask questions. But my father took me aside and I remember very distinctly that he he looked me like straight in the face and said, you can ask any question you want. God's word can take it. More broadly on the topic of Christianity, I would tell Christian students, you can ask any question you want. You don't have to be afraid. This is not something where where you have to willfully avoid certain topics, willfully avoid certain professors. I, I think Christianity can stand up to the scrutiny. But of course, you have to be willing to, to put the hard work in to understand those topics and, and search out the arguments and see where they go. Beyond that, I think uh, sometimes we approach science in a fairly unemotional way. But from both Christians and non-Christians, I think I'm seeing more and more of a move toward a sense of wonder. You study science, you see an awesome reaction happen, and it wells up within you a sense of wonder. A lot of people don't know what to do with that, but the Christian does. The Christian says, I feel a sense of wonder, and that's the way God wanted me to feel. When I see the way that atoms interact with each other, how molecules are formed, I'm seeing the building blocks of the universe and the way that God put them together. And so I think that sense of wonder fits nicely within the Christian worldview. It's an opportunity to worship, and it shows that Christians who are in the science are not wasting their time. Sometimes people think that. They think, oh, I'm wasting my time if I'm not studying theology. You can glorify God and and accomplish great things within the sciences. Recently, there's been sort of a resurgence, particularly popular interest in apologetics. Mm -hmm. And with that, there comes this mindset that essentially says that if you're going to be a faithful Christian in an academic setting, 
it's your job to go and defend the Bible against those evil atheist professors or that. Or sure, sure. I, I mean, those those hostile atheist professors are my friends. They're my <laughs> colleagues, you know. And yeah. um, the truth is they're not cartoon villains or whatever like some movies may, may portray them. I think what both your fellow students and your professors will respect is a, a searching out for truth, a willingness to understand where the other side's coming from and be able to construct the argument from their point of view. They're looking for uh, fellow truth seekers. And so if you come at it from from that perspective rather than a, we're going to have a debate and I'm going to win and yeah, like I think that's a little too narcissistic and self-serving. It, the truth is that Christians should have excellent relationships, uh, great conversations with with people who, who believe differently. The real enemy, I think, for Christians in academia is not disagreements and arguments and difficulties with people or professors who believe differently than you do. The real enemy is complacency. Your average student doesn't want to talk about anything that really matters. And so for the Christian student, the goal has to be to get beyond the daily trivialities and talk about things that really matter. The tragedy of a university education would not be one where you're having to contend for your beliefs and a professor makes you look stupid, anything like that. That, that kind of comes with the territory. The real tragedy would be if no one ever talked about anything of importance at all. This is not a plug, but to plug Rastro Christi, uh, would you say that would be a great student organization that would facilitate those conversations? I, I would say that. I especially like the fact that at Ratio Christi, it's not emotionally charged. Like people come and we discuss. It allows people to look at these different ways of, of seeing a particular issue or in a, in a setting where everyone really has the same goal of trying to understand their arguments better, understand what they believe and why. I mentioned on your CV uh, earlier that you're a professor of chemical engineering. What I didn't mention is that you actually went to Harvard at one point. Yes, this is true. I got my PhD at MIT, which is in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And oddly enough, you have two of these giants of American academia just down the street from each other, Harvard and MIT. I found out that if you are enrolled at one school, it's quite easy to enroll for classes at the other school. So I took several classes at Harvard Divinity School. And it was an interesting experience. Uh, the rumors that Harvard is in a post-Christian state, uh, those rumors are correct. And most of the students, if you really quiz them what do you believe about about God and his existence and his relevance to your life? Quite a few of them would effectively espouse atheism. And I kept thinking, why are you here? What are you studying? And for some of them, it was the equivalent of, of studying religion in an anthropology kind of sense. But I also think quite a few of the students, they, they weren't interested in the miracles and supernatural trappings of religion, but they were interested in the power of religion to affect social justice. You know, they, looking at someone as great as Martin Luther King and what he was able to accomplish from, from within a religious context, I think they, they really admired that. And so they're in this uncomfortable position where they're interested in social justice, they're interested, interested in societal change from a religious perspective, but they're kind of unwilling to commit themselves to the academically not cool position of, of actually saying, yes, there is a God, yes, he acts in the world. One other thing I saw at Harvard came from the professors. Some professors, they, they suffered from, uh, I think the common phrase is chronological snobbery, which is the belief that we in the modern times are, are smart and anyone who came before was ignorant and uninformed and foolish and we don't have anything to learn from them. And you could even hear it in, in the way they, um, they approached a given topic. They would say, let's see what these primitive people believed, blah, blah, blah. And uh, I didn't learn too much from those professors. <laughs> There were some other professors who had an attitude, today we get to read Augustine. It's our privilege to learn from this brilliant person. And as a scientist, as an engineer, that immediately resonated with me. Because any scientist or engineer who really knows what they're doing, they realize we don't have great te technology because we're smarter than the people who came before us. The fact that we even have textbooks with equations in them is a testament to the people who came before us. To write an equation is a big deal. You're making a truth statement. Mm -hmm. And so some brilliant person who didn't have a calculator, who didn't have the internet, figured these things out a long time ago, and we're like little ants building on top of that huge foundation. So engineering is a discipline where you can have great pride in your discipline, but you need a lot of humility when it comes to yourself and your own intelligence. And so that idea of a respect and appreciation and humility toward the past really resonated with me. And I actually carry that over into every class that I teach. 
what exactly was your area of study, your main focus, and how did you approach this environment from your own point of view as a, as a committed Christian? Some of the classes were focused on church history, and those were not nearly so controversial. The, the most controversial aspects and the parts that I really had to think through mostly had to do with the historical Jesus. As you may know, there, there have been a number of uh, scholarly studies where they try to figure out who was the historical Jesus, what kind of things did he really believe. They're called quests. The quests, yeah. that's right. The third quest, the no quest, the Are new we on quest. the third or the fourth one now? I oh, I don't know. It depends on who's making the rules. But um, <laughs> the basic idea in each of these cases is to try to figure out what did the real Jesus believe. And what I basically learned is that most of the questers have certain presuppositions when they come to the table, and based on those presuppositions, they they throw out a lot of of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. And then based on what's left, they say, oh, look, the the data remaining fits my hypothesis. Therefore, my hypothesis (laughs) is right. it's, It's really problematic. A good example would be someone who comes to the text with a, a very high level of skepticism. If it sounds Jewish, then it, that just belonged to the first century uh, Jewish culture. That's not really Jesus. Or if it sounds like the early church, then the early church made it up and it's not really Jesus. And you're left with something relatively small. And mm-hmm. so you're not able to, to gauge a whole lot from that. And so I guess if, if there's anyone who's going through that process and trying to figure out what did, what did the historical Jesus say, what did he believe, um, I would encourage them to read a little N.T. Wright. He shows that Jesus both operated within the context of first century Judaism. He spoke the language that they spoke, both literally and metaphorically. He, he said things that made sense to them, but yet challenged their worldview at the same time. It's really astounding. When, once you dig into it, you start realizing people understood what he was trying to say, and then they were astounded by it. He blows up everybody's expectations. And one of Wright's conclusions is Jesus messes up people's expectations so much that one can only conclude that it, no one would have made it up, especially in, where the resurrection comes along. No one had that expectation. No one thought that was going to happen. And so if no one expected it, if no one had that expectation, no one made it up, then that means it really happened. So Wright writes from a a scholarly view with people like the folks at Harvard Divinity School in mind. Well, that certainly stands in contrast to the sort of popular view of Jesus that didn't, he was just some random guy and then the early church got together in 325. Right, right. Yeah, the truth is that a lot of these concepts, they're they're very clearly there in the first century. And we get this not only from the New Testament, but from even secular Roman sources at the time. Not just what did the people believe, but what did they do? It was very clear that they worshiped Jesus. They, they had some kind of Lord's Supper type activity that they would do where they're using temple and sacrificial language, but they're not going to the temple. They're clearly celebrating what Jesus has done. They're, they're referring to him in theistic language, talking about him in those kind of terms. So I think that the truth is things like the canon, like the Trinity, the church had always believed that, but they, didn't, they never had to quite crystallize it until certain heresies along the way challenged it. Uh, one funny illustration my wife once came up with is um, sometimes you see little warning labels like on a shirt. It says, do not iron this shirt while you're wearing it. And they only added that label after, and, you know, after some fool actually did it. And so it's kind of the same thing with a lot of church doctrine. They only outlined in very specific form the doctrine once some heretic challenged it. But it, it had been there since the beginning. All right. One little thing before our time is up today. We're going to play a little game. You're on a boat, and unfortunately, this boat uh, has just, you've just been shipwrecked, and you're on a deserted island. Okay. So my question is, what are those five books that you'd bring with you to a deserted island? Five books that you can have with you, and there's one book that you can leave behind for the next unfortunate traveler. So some books that I find myself turning to time and time again, I'll, I'll, I'll list a couple of old books. Augustine's Confessions and The Pensées by Blaise Pascal. Both of those... I read them, and it's like this historical figure was, you know, thinking some of the same thoughts and struggling with some of the things, same things that I've struggled with. And so those both really affected me a lot, and I, I love them both dearly. Uh, I'll cheat and bring along the entire Jonathan Edwards collection that I have. I know Edwards has this this reputation of, of being a fire and brimstone preacher, but the truth is most of what he talks about is he, he uses language like sweetness and affection. And his point is to drive us not only toward the truths of who God is, but also how we should feel about them. And a great preacher always does that. They'll say, don't just get the right factoids in your head, but feel the sweetness, the excellence 
in your heart so that you love these things and you trust these things and not just believe with your head. One more I would bring, this is totally geeky, but I would bring Lord of the Rings with me. This book actually affected me very strongly. Um, I reread it my first year in grad school where I was really struggling with some doubt. Um, I, I had struggled with what if the skeptics are right and what if you cease to exist after you die and you know those kind of questions. And uh, rereading Lord of the Rings made me realize um, the world we see is full of creativity and beauty and high stakes, and it's not the boring gray drabness and boringness that we would expect on naturalism. And so it really kind of brought me out of the existential funk that I was in. And then for fun, I'll, I'll bring the, the full Calvin and Hobbes treasury just because it always makes me laugh. One last part of this game, it looks like a rescue ship has come across the sea. You get to leave one book behind for the next unfortunate traveler. Which book do you leave behind? Well, I don't know who the travel traveler will be, but the so the kind of the general book I would leave behind and kind of just recommend to everybody generally is Desiring God by John Piper. Um, I read that book when I was like 19 or so, and it, it, it was one of those books that revolutionized the way I look at everything, things like God's sovereignty, God's glory, God's purposes. And once I read that book, I feel like I saw everything else in a different light. And from a Christian practice standpoint, it also really cemented in my mind the idea that sin is not only wrong, it's foolish. You always regret it. It always leads to less happiness. And so the person who totally devotes themselves to God is, is someone who is seeking their greatest happiness and their greatest fulfillment because that is actually found in God and not in these little trivial things that we pursue.